Using contemporary war diaries, Tim has established where Alfred was when he witnessed the bombing of Abbeville. Let's go this way. Along this line here. He's brought Patrick to the spot where the Coily train pulled up. The Coily were travelling along this line here. And if you read this, this paragraph here, it'll give you some idea of where we are. As the train neared Abbeville about 3 p.m., the town was seen to be in flames beneath a heavy cloud of smoke. Half a mile from the town, the train stopped and the battalion detrained while a heavy air attack took place. It was a nasty spot with the railway line bounded on the south side by a wide marsh and on the north by the Somme Canal. So leaving a party to guard the train, the battalion crossed the canal by a bridge uh, and disappeared in the fields from where they had an excellent view of modern war at its foulest. It was the only safe place they could get to where they could actually keep the battalion together. People like your father basically just trying to guide the battalion into safety over that side. was the, the bombing raid ahead. Bombs started to fall alongside the railway line. And one man describes bombs landing in the, the fields next to them and bits of tree and bits of cow raining down onto the, the train. While the Coily took cover in the fields, they saw hundreds of refugees fleeing from Abbeville. This is the, a diary that was kept by one of the, the men in the Coily. During the raids, refugees fled along the banks of the Somme from Abbeville. It was pitiful to see them. Old men, women of all ages, and young children with a few belongings. One girl, about 18 years of age, passed through our ranks laughing wildly. She was alone and had a mad expression on her face. By now, there are around 8 million refugees in France fleeing from the fighting. They were regarded as legitimate targets by the Germans, who deliberately bombed refugee columns to create fear and panic, choke up the roads, and hinder Allied movements. Looking down the line, you'd see the smoke, you'd see the refugees coming down the line here. Yes. The stream. It, it must have seemed like a nightmare, a nightmare bloody chaos. Yeah. During a break in the bombing, the driver of the train drove off and never returned. Now with no means of transport, Alfred and the troops had no choice but to retreat. They set off down the railway track on foot, away from the burning town. The Coily and your father set off, but on the way they came across damaged trains, including a hospital train and it was wrecked and, and one man describes walking along the train and seeing two children laid in the grass and realised they were both dead and killed by the blast. Not a mark on them. And these were men who had never seen sights like this before? No. My father told me a story of coming upon a train that had been uh, strafed and bombed. And he noticed as he went by one shattered window that there was a hand hanging, a woman's hand, with a ring on her finger. He noticed it as he went by. And then sometime later coming back up the train, he saw that the hand was still there, but the finger that had the ring on it was gone. Well, I was a child when he told me this story. And of course it it both fascinated and horrified me. But I do remember something in my father's voice and face when he told me that story. There was a sense of disgust and shame and even fury. Maybe that story was about here. If so, so far as I'm aware, it's the only tale he told about this period of his life. Train full of 
Belgian troops with artillery and machine guns traveling in opposite direction to us. They grinned at us and made gestures of throat cutting, pointing in the direction. Whether he intended to escape or not, Alfred did eventually return to Murfield and married Gladys in 1933. By this time, he'd been promoted to the rank of Lance